Uh, my name is Chris Lyon. I'm a technical sales representative with Prolon Controls, and we're going to be introducing you to the Flex IO controllers today. So uh, this will build slightly on the previous uh, sessions that we've had, um, but, but not too terribly much. The Flex IO controller is a controller that can stand very well on its own. So um, moving into it, just to recap, we have our C1000 and our M2000 hardware. This is the same C1000 and M2000 hardware that we've seen before, but we do have one slight difference um, as far as our uh, hardware on the C1000. With the uh, M2000, uh, we have some input jumpers in there that we can move around but uh, we do not have that on the C1000 hardware. So uh, that limits us. If you need a C1000 Flex IO, it must come from the factory as a Flex IO. It cannot be reprogrammed to be a different controller type. So you can't take a, Flex, a C1000 Flex IO and turn it into a VAV or a rooftop controller. Um, and you also uh, cannot turn another controller into a C1000 Flex IO because of these hardware limitations. And we'll see why that uh, is the case in just a little bit here. Uh, with the M2000, there are no reprogramming limitations. Any M2000 controller can become any other M2000 controller. So uh, let's just talk about some uh, input signals that we're ready to deal with on the Flex IO. So we've got, uh, your types of inputs, we're going to have um, <clears throat> hardware inputs. These are physically connected directly to the Flex I.O. So uh, it can be a thermistor. If we're using a thermistor, it will always be a 10K Type 3. We do not support any other thermistors out there. We can also accept uh, contact, so just on off. Uh, voltage, 0 to 5 or 1 to 5 volts DC or current in 0 to 20 or 4 to 20 milliamps. So a lot of different uh, signals that we could use with this. Uh, as far as transmitters, this could be representing temperature, okay, including li linear transducers. Now you've heard me say before, anytime we say temperature and prolon in the same sentence, it is a 10K type 3. And for the most part, that is true. But on the Flex IO, we did add support for the 0 to 5, 1 to 5, 0 to 20, 4 to 20 milliamp signals um, in the form of a transducer representing temperature. So you can do that with the Flex IO. Um, we've got pressure in uh, inches of water, PSI, Pascals, uh, contacts, and we can uh, choose from an operation where uh, we can function momentarily or maintained. Um, it's of course just gonna be on or off. Gas concentration, parts per million, parts per billion, electrical signals, volts, milliamps, amps, hertz, kilowatts, um, flow in gallons per minute, CFM, liters per second, feet per minute, meters per second, speed and RPM, uh, levels in inches, feet, meters, millimeters, and we have some general use of percentage and a no unit. So if none of those worked for you, you can actually just give it a name that means something to you. Say, take uh, this signal and scale it across this range of numbers, and then it'll be available for you to interpret from there. So that's our hardware inputs. I have uh, network inputs also. Um, obviously, if we're talking about a network input, that means we do have a network in place. This wouldn't be available if we had a completely standalone Flex IO controller. So if we're involving a network controller, we will have our outside air temperature and we will have our occupancy slots available. So occupancy slots, I'll show you how those work later, but we get one slot per output. So it's gonna vary based on the hardware. The M2000 will have eight occupancy slots. The C1000 will only have five. Also, if we take this Flex IO and we install it as a follower under a master like a rooftop, we now have access to uh, some network outputs from that rooftop, such as the supply air temperature. Uh, we can access the math functions that are representing a heating or cooling demand. And we can also get fan status, which that main purpose is for binding. And I'll, I'll show you how we can use some of these. So I told you how the C1000 has to come from the factory as a Flex IO. 
And the reason is we do not have these jumpers that we do on the M2000. So different input signals require different electrical circuits, depending on if we're measuring a resistance or we're measuring a voltage or we're measuring a current. And we have to actually change the, the input circuitry uh, electrically. And we do that with a jumper inside. So um, in order to do that, we do have to take apart the M2000. So anytime you're gonna open up a controller before you remove that cover, always power down the, the controller so that you don't have any lights on there. And then you see the four screws at the corners. They're just a quarter turn spring latch. You're, you're gonna give those a quarter turn and, and they'll spring up and then you'll be able to remove the cover. Once you've done that, notice that you'll, you'll have a couple little boards up on top and then those are on a larger board. And we wanna look at that larger board. You see the 32 pin connectors. You can see the backside of the solder connections for the pins. Um, that is where essentially the upper and lower boards are physically connected to each other. And we're just gonna grasp at the top and the bottom, gently wiggle as we pull straight out on that. And that's gonna reveal this bottom board where our input jumpers are. So um, we have a nice little diagram right in the middle that shows you how to uh, align the jumpers for the different type of signal you plan on bringing into that input. Uh, usually we don't have to have this conversation when we're talking about RTUs or um, other controllers, boiler controllers that we set these jumpers ahead of time for you at the factory, but we really can't do that on the flex IO because we don't know what you're, what you're going to be doing. So flex IO very likely your. Um, so, uh, Note that the um, if we're doing a contact input, that we are going to have to excuse me one second. Okay, note if we're doing a contact input, we have to uh, set that in the thermistor mode. And if you think about that logically, that makes sense. Uh, thermistor is uh, measuring resistance. And contact, we're essentially just looking for continuity on that. Okay, the jumper numbers, if you look, those jumper numbers, they, they jump by twos. You're, they're gonna count one, three, five, seven. Um, that's obviously not gonna correlate to an input number. Um, you're gonna match the jumper position to the input position. Now, uh, most importantly, when we're going back together, you have to make sure that these 32 pin connectors at the top and the bottom get lined up absolutely perfect. If you're lined up one pin to the left, one pin to the right, one pin high, one pin low, when you plug that in, if you happen to do that, you're okay, as long as you don't put power to the controller. But keep in mind, all these pins, they're creating the complete electrical circuits between the two boards. And if you misalign that, you're creating circuits that never meant to be. And if you apply power, you will permanently damage the controller, okay? As long as you don't apply power, you know, double check those pins, um, be, be very diligent with this. So, um, okay, so that's setting up our inputs, looking at our outputs, we've got a couple different types, digital outputs. Digital outputs are typically going to be an on-off or a differential response. So um, we can provide a modulating signal in the form of a one second PWM. About the only place that that really works for us is if we are modulating uh, an SCR or a triac for an electric heat kit, something like that. So um, the digital outputs will provide 24 volt AC. Okay, so the, the 24 volts that's coming in to power up the controller, just like a thermostat would with uh, you bring R in and then you send back your G, your Y, your W. Okay, it's going to work in the same way. But the C1000 does also have the option to uh, run the digital outputs in a sync mode where they are essentially a dry contact. Okay, analog outputs. Typically, these are going to be used for a proportional response, a, a valve that we need to open so far or, or a fan or a pump that we need to speed up and slow down. So 
Usually we're gonna see these as a zero to 10 or two to 10 volt DC. Um, they, this is configurable in there. But say if I just have a whole bunch of digital outputs that I, I need to control, I don't really need the analog output logic. We can cause our analog outputs to function with a digital logic where they will either be zero volts or 10 volts. But note that the analog outputs are only capable of a maximum 10 volts DC. They're never gonna give you 24 volt AC. So uh, you will likely need to involve a relay to, to make sure that you are uh, getting your contact closure there. Just show you the uh, IO detail on this. Um, it's very generic, okay? Because we don't know what you're gonna do. There's no, uh, no uses predetermined for inputs or outputs. Um, so the main thing to note here on your uh, C1000 is that we do have a single common for all of your inputs. So analog input one, analog input two, analog input three, and the digital input all are gonna share that screw terminal 15 as their common. Then something else to note, um, it, just uh, because it can be a limitation, screw terminal 17, that is a digital input. It can only accept an on off signal. It cannot read a value from a thermistor or, or voltage, anything like that, okay? When we make it over to the M2000, this changes our uh, layout a little bit in that we now have screws, screw terminal connections for all of our inputs on both the input and the common side. So everybody gets their own screw, just kind of cleans everything up on there. Also, all of those inputs are universal. So you could bring a contact or any type of voltage or thermistor into any of those inputs, uh, just depending on how you set the jumper like we uh, spoke about previously. Okay, so the whole purpose of bringing inputs and controlling outputs is to apply some sort of a logic to it, okay? So if you choose a temperature-based input as what you are uh, focusing on to control something, it will automatically be a heating or cooling logic. You'll choose that in the software. If it's something other than heating, uh, than a temperature base, if it's pressure or, or gas concentration, whatever, you're gonna have a direct or a reverse logic, okay? So um, a example of a direct logic is uh, a bypass damper on his own system where as my pressure increases, I also want to increase the output of my signal to open the damper more in order to reduce the pressure. If we flip that output over to a VFD on a fan, it would now become reverse logic where as our pressure comes up, we will want to slow the fan down to reduce our pressure in the ductwork. So it's gonna operate uh, opposite of what the signal is doing, okay? So we've got differential, which are just on or off. We choose a point where we wanna turn on, we choose a point where we turn off, that's it. We have proportional where we can ramp up and down, speeding up, slowing down fans, pumps, wh whatever you need to. And the PI is tunable in there. You can choose your proportional, choose your integral. A, and uh, we can even help provide a little guidance through tech support on how to get that going. Your set points, they can be fixed or they can reset automatically based on other hardware or network inputs. So I'll show you how you can set up resets in there. I can automatically force outputs on or off based on outside air temperature and or occupancy. So we, we can have a, an output that we, when we get so warm outside, you know, this output was for a heater, it's not gonna be able to turn on even if uh, other criteria are met. We can create relationships between different outputs. I can bind them together. So I, I could say, just an example would be an output that would enable maybe a chiller. But before that chiller can run, I need to have a pump running, okay? So I'm gonna turn the pump on, I'm gonna prove that that pump started, and then I will allow the chiller to run based on its temperature logic. 
Okay. I can even take two outputs and I can create a lead lag with failover relationship. Okay. Um, now, just keep in mind, we can only do one lead lag sequence per Flex IO, and this has to do with, with the memory and storage capacity limitations of the hardware. Um, so if I had four pumps that I need to operate in two sets of two with the lead lag rotation, um, and that's all I need to control, I will still need two flex IOs because each flex can only handle one set of those pumps. Now I'm just gonna show you here to uh, wrap up the PowerPoint on this. Um, remember our network communication here, we have a, a master with a, its uh, follower zones under it. You could install this flex IO on that same bus with the zones and it can work directly with that master. Or we can just put it directly on the main communication bus coming off of the NC2000. And um, you know we're not gonna have features like the math functions um, available or, or supply temp, those kind of things, but you'll still have your occupancy slots and your outdoor air temperature. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to switch over to focus. And we will uh, look at what we can do with some flex IOs. Let's just start off with the C1000. You'll see we, we open up, we've got our analog inputs, we have our digital input. So when I go choose a digital input, I only have two options, off or contact, because I can't accept any of these other uh, types of inputs. But if I have uh, temperature, Okay, here's my 10K type three, that's what I will default to, but look here, here's all of those linear transducer options. Okay, zero to five, one to five, four to 20. Um, I think I forgot to mention 0. 0.5 to 4.5, we, we do see that occasionally. Um, and then zero to 20 milliamps in there. You can give this a friendly name so that you, uh, you know what it is and you can apply a calibration to it if you see fit. So here I have a, uh, if I choose a contact, when the contact is closed, display on screen as um, open, closed, or on, off, yes, no. So do, just some simple um, Boolean terms that we can choose from on there. I can also have this operate, just default operation, when I am electrically closed on the input, I'm, I'm on, the, the input is on. We can also have a, a hold. So this would be like, um, say, install a momentary contact mushroom button over on the wall. A, and somebody, they, they go and push that. A, and so the contacts close and then they open back up. Well, my input can remain in a logically closed position for a, a predetermined um, override time. We can also make it that uh, a second push, if we're on, when we close the contacts again and open them, it will turn off. So this could be used potentially for say a lighting override. And uh, you come in on the weekend, you push the button, it's gonna give you one hour of override turning the lights on but you get done in 30 minutes where you can go just hit the button again and the lights will turn back off, okay? So just some different uses there. Here we're heading into the other transducers, pressure, you'll choose inches, PSI, Pascals. Once you're into these uh, transducers, you still need to select your signal type that's coming in and then the range of that transducer, okay? We can also work with bi-directional transducers. So if you're de dealing with, uh, you know, say it's a four to 20 milliamp signal a and we're doing differential pressure and it's minus five to five inches, okay? So we can go negative in there if it's a bi-directional transducer. Um, gas parts per million, what is your, your scaling? 
and uh, we're just moving down through that list and we get all the way to the bottom. Um, we do have that no unit, so it's not gonna apply any unit to it uh, on the display. It's just, I give it a, a name that means something and, and scale these numbers across this signal. Something to keep in mind, think about this percentage and percentage is still scalable. Where could I use that? Um, combustible gas, okay? So typically a, an LEL sensor, full scale on it is zero to 50% LEL. So, you know, if that's a four to 20 milliamp, you know, we can have that show properly rather than reading the full signal range, it'll show the LEL range. So that, that is just something that we can, we can do there. So I'm gonna move over to the M2000 just since it has more, uh, more inputs and outputs. And let's start building some stuff here. So let me just grab analog input one. We'll have a uh, temperature and, and we'll just call this um, mechanical room. We'll use stick with the 10K type three. Now something that's nice in the flex, if you take the time to turn off all of your unused inputs they will actually disappear out of all of the menus off of the home screen everything and just it cleans everything up quite a bit so take a look when i get this all done you hit apply you're going to go back to the home screen here's my one mechanical room temperature okay here's my network inputs that are potentially available um, the, those will only populate when you're online and uh, it is receiving that from a given controller Okay, outputs, I don't have any outputs configured yet. So let's just go set up a digital output. And we're just gonna have this follow a local input. This will be my mechanical room fan. And we can have a set point on this of say 80 degrees with a cooling logic. And here's that where we choose that differential. Okay, I'm on a digital output. I don't really want to choose a PI because a digital output can only be on or off. If I choose a, a proportional response, it's going to cause this output to turn on and off in a one second PWM interval. So what that means is if this output were to calculate that it needs 25%, uh, it is going to turn on for a quarter of a second and then be off for three quarters of a second, okay? So something that's designed to be on or off, you can see how, how things can go sideways pretty quick on that. So we want a differential response and we're just gonna give a little bit of uh, leeway here. We'll say uh, two degrees. So by the time, hover over differential, by the time I reach 80 plus one half of two. So at 81 degrees, I'll turn this fan on at 79 degrees, I'll turn this fan off. We can arrange that however we, uh, we see fit. Um, we can also say, well, if outside temperature is less than um, zero, set this output to off. If it's really cold outside, maybe we don't wanna be sucking super cold air in, okay? So there I've got my mechanical room. Maybe this is on uh, a VFD. So now I can go to my analog output and we're still gonna have it follow the same local input. Mech room. Mech room fan speed. So we're gonna wanna coordinate with this and say, well, uh, we don't turn it on until 81. So maybe by the time we reach 84, we want this to start uh, ramping up speed. And we'll use a zero to 10 volt DC signal to ramp up the speed on this, okay? I can even, set up another input for say a contact for mech fan proof, okay? So and we can have this show a, as yes. So when that fan turns on, we will get proof back 
that yes, it is running. And then we can say um, on that analog output, well, until the fan is proven to be running, we don't need to be trying to control its speed, you know, just to make sure that stuff is, uh, is staying off and we don't take off running with that fan um, full speed all of a sudden. Maybe it is a concern, maybe it isn't a concern, but, uh, you know, just some options for you. So we've got our fan set up here. Let's go do something uh, completely different. Now I can have a, um, oh, let's say an input, oh, sorry, an input for um, pressure in the building. So we'll have, Building pressure, and we'll use a, uh, a zero to five transducer that is zero to uh, one inch water column. Okay, so that that sounds good there. Now I can go uh, to another analog output, and we are going to have this follow a local input of my building pressure. And this will be my building relief damper. Okay, so here's my, my building relief damper and say we're gonna put this at oh, 0 0.05 and we do want a proportional response on that, okay? We wouldn't have uh, maybe any conditions that we want to have this shut down under. So I've got a completely separate sequence going in the same flex IO. Um, you know, we can keep on going. Just because you're using a flex for one particular purpose doesn't mean that that's all you're allowed to do. Um, see that the icon is still blank there. Um, again, we don't know what's important to you. So we can go into the icon setup and we can choose um, you know, we want to watch, watch the building pressure. We can put up to four lines on here, and we want to see the um, we want to see the fan speed, and then let's look at our um, damper position, and we can say make the icon blue when the fan is on. Okay, so we apply all those. We'll see the information pop up in the icon there, okay? I'm gonna head over to a different Flex, show you some features that are available when you install this as uh, a follower device. Here, here I have a uh, Flex IO. This is on my test bench right beside me. Um, this Flex IO is installed as a follower under this rooftop. So if you notice now, I have my network inputs. I can see my outside temperature uh, of uh, 30 degrees, my supply temperature, okay, 55.4, you know, we're, we're right in the, the same range there, so I know what temperature is going out. I have math functions. What do these math functions represent? Well, I've got minus 33, I've got 33. So math one through five, if we look in the rooftop, we can see that uh, math one is looking at cooling, math two is looking at heating. Okay, so I could use that in this uh, in this flex IO to say operate um, a mixing valve. So if I wanted to target, um, let's go get an input here, and let's just say or have our heat exchanger output. We'll have a, a temperature on there and uh, tell that apply. And now if I want a mixing valve, we're gonna have this follow my heat exchanger output. And we'll have it with a set point of uh, 110 PI so that we're, we're modulating this, okay? But I can also do a reset. 
what could I reset off of? Well, I could reset off of um, a network variable of outside temperature. And so we'll say that at, uh, you know, maybe at 40, we're going to target 90. And by the time we get to minus five, we're going to target um, 130. Oh, I got those backwards, sorry. See, we have those little pop-ups in there. So that when you screw up like that, we'll, we'll catch you. So we're, we need to move these numbers around. Okay, so there's my reset scale. So if we're 40 degrees or above, we're gonna target a 90 degree temperature. Input one, and that's gonna be controlling my mixing valve. I could also reset off of some some wild numbers that, that hop in here. We're just gonna straighten this out real quick to um, say at a 10% um, heating demand and at a 70% heating demand. Once again, we're gonna move these guys around. But there, I will actually run my reset off of the demand of the zones or, or you know whatever's going into that math function he, here i have my vc 2000s i've got bob's office up there They're, those are all feeding into the math functions and being calculated by this rooftop and that's telling me what's going on in my building and if i need warmer or cooler water on that so um, we can also say well we we don't need to worry about this if we're unoccupied or we can say well if the outside temperature is, is less than um, zero so really cold outside we can set a minimum on here and say well keep keep that valve always open for sure uh, under any conditions or we can lock it to a certain value we can we could reach a point where we say well, once we go below zero, resets out the window and we're just gonna go for everything we got, okay? So um, however you choose to, to use that. Real easy, uh, we do this a lot with a hot deck, cold deck system. So we would typically install a zoning rooftop controller to manage the cooling side of the, the hot deck, cold deck unit. And then we put a flex IO in looking at the um, hot deck, and it's really gonna work in the same way. And this will be temperature again. So now we can set up my analog output, looking at a local input of the hot deck. hot deck valve, and then um, this will be a heating PI loop in there, and we'll do a, uh, a reset again based on uh, demand. And this is really good, um, you know, that way on your uh, hot deck, cold deck unit, you are not always sending hot air out on the hot deck when nobody wants it, okay? So say by the time you get up to a 60%, um, you know, you're, you're gonna target, say normal will be say 78, and then we'll go up to 105 on our hot deck, okay? So real easy to, um, to do a hot deck cold deck unit with this um 
with your uh, occupancy slots. So I told you we, we've got occupancy slots available where there's, there's only one time clock in this, uh, in this controller. Um, so if we do have a schedule going, let's see. So I actually have a schedule written to this one from my NC2000. But what I can do is back at my network controller, I can create a uh, weekly routine. So let's just do new schedule, warehouse, and um, real quick, we'll just do 6 a.m., 6 p.m., and we're gonna copy Monday to every other day but Sunday. Okay, so here I've got my warehouse schedule. I can now go into my distribution. I wanna distribute a schedule and look at this. So my rooftop, my zones, they each can receive occupancy, but when I get to the Flex IO, here I have all these different slots. Okay, slot one, slot two, slot three. This is an M2000 Flex IO, so I have eight slots because I have eight outputs. If I had a C1000 Flex IO, you're only going to see um, five slots. See, here's my C1000, address 51. I've only got five slots there because I only have five outputs available. Okay, so I can park this right into, we'll just use slot three for fun. We're gonna have that follow the warehouse schedule. And now I can come over to that Flex IO. Oh, wrong way. So I can come over to that Flex IO and we can see here, Occupancy three, we are occupied. Nothing else is being written to. That's why they're they're in A. So occupancy one is uh, either coming from the rooftop or from the internal time clock. In this case, because it's a, set up as a follower, I've told it to look at the rooftop. Okay. So um, now with that occupancy three, I can get a digital output and say. Um, we're going to follow a network variable of occupancy slot three output on when occupied. And this is warehouse lights. Okay. So just like that, not only do I have a schedule that can go to one individual controller, but I'm going to one individual out put on one individual controller, okay? So we, we actually had somebody, uh, maybe wasn't the best choice, but they turned a Flex IO into an irrigation sprinkler timer and had their schedules just kind of leapfrogging, okay? It worked. Like I said, probably not the best choice, but, but it did get the job done, okay? So some other things that we can uh, do with this, um, let me get back into the Flex IO here. Um, we've got our, uh, we, we've been over fixed set points, we've been over set point resets. We have logical or virtual outputs. Okay, so let me set up a, lead lag rotation here. So I'm just gonna grab, um, I'm gonna do a couple of pumps, but we'll use input four as a contact. And this is going to be pump one proof. So we'll say yes. And then uh, again here, I'm gonna set up pump two proof. As yes, we just want those to operate as normal, okay? 
So now I can set up digital output two is going to be based off of, let's just say a, a network variable of outside temperature and um, we'll have our circ pumps in there. And these pumps, they're already gonna turn on you know, when, when we hit 45 degrees outside. So um, what we wanna do, we'll use a heating logic on this so that once our outside temperature goes below 45, we will start trying to heat the great outdoors. Obviously that, that's not what's really happening here but we're applying a heating logic. When, when outside gets cold is when we want this to turn on. So we'll just give a little, um, little buffer here on the differential so that we don't end up with on off on off if the outside temperature is kind of waffling around a little bit. So here's my uh, circ pump one. And now, I want uh, circ pump two needs to back that guy up. So I'm gonna grab another digital output. And instead of choosing local input or network or anything, this guy is a backup and the screen's gonna look quite a bit different. I can back up any other output that's already been set up. So we're gonna use circ pump one because this is gonna be circ pump two. So there's circ pump two. If you've set up lead lag before failover in the boiler controller, it looks exactly the same. So activate backup if source does not prove operation after one minute. I'm not that generous. I give 10 seconds personally. And then we choose our lead lag. How do we want to lead lag rotate? Um, remember, if you use the equal runtime, that does require you to satisfy and for the outputs to shut off, okay? So likely in this case, we're gonna want a fixed runtime so that we don't uh, end up with one pump running all through winter when we're staying um, cold outside. So proof of the source output, what is my source output? The source is circ pump one, I am going to use pump one proof. Proof of this output, this is circ pump two. I'm gonna use pump two proof. Now you do not have to do this. Say, um, say you have a common flow switch. A, after uh, you know the pipes split, go through the two pumps and then reconverge and you have a common flow switch. It is perfectly acceptable to point these to the same proof source. But I'm just gonna go ahead and use separate, uh, separate sources of proof there. Um, we still have the exercise option in here same as on the boiler, and we will allow, we can allow both outputs to turn on if backup fails to prove. Okay, so just think about what's being said there. Okay, if backup fails to prove. So pump one, you're up. Okay, pump, pump one, you've had your 10 seconds, you failed. Pump two, your turn. Uh-oh, both pumps have failed to prove. Well, if we're dealing with little circulator pumps, or maybe there's some sort of external pressure control involved, and it is just desperately critical that hopefully we have some flow, some water movement running. We can say, well, turn these both on and let's just hope that something's being done. Now, if these are just on off pumps, no VFDs, no pressure relief, anything, and each pump can handle the full capacity of the system on its own, you turn both of them on, you could possibly create some issues their um, leakage, um, blowing things up. So that's why we make that as an option, okay? So if the backup fails, we're just gonna fail to the backup in this, uh, we'll continue trying to run that uh, pump two or whichever is the backup at the moment, okay? So here's our lead lag setup. We hit apply and these, Two outputs 
circ pump one, circ pump two, they are going to work together as one. And you see how there after 10 seconds we rotated. So now let's just say, you know, maybe I didn't want to put the chiller controller in and I'm just going to throw a, a simple chiller enable out. So let's grab, uh, let's see, here's my backup status, both fail. Okay, so you, you've got an alert there. We can even get an email alert out of the NC2000. So I have my uh, digital output four. We're gonna have this follow um, that we need an input first. So let's grab temperature, chilled water supply, and we're gonna have digital output for control off of chilled water supply. See how that list is starting to get, get pretty full there? Um, and this will be just a chiller enable. Okay, so we'll get my, uh, my set point of 42, obviously a cooling logic, and we'll give it a four degree differential. We could apply a reset to that if we so desired. But I wanna make sure that my pumps are running before I have the, this uh, chiller going. So I can say, uh, well, deactivate this when, okay, we have a problem here. I, I can say, well, circ pump one is off or when circ pump two is off, but what happens when they rotate? So this is gonna create a little bit of an issue for me because I don't wanna to have to be in here flipping back and forth all the time. So that's where our virtual outputs come in. Um, we found in the first generation of the Flex IO that we occasionally had to sacrifice outputs just for the sake of logic to be able to bind to. So that's where we created the virtual output. So I'm gonna have this virtual output look at my pump one proof, and I can also bind this to activate this output when pump two is on, okay? So virtual output one will turn on logically if pump one proof is on when that contact is closed. I'm also going to force virtual output one to activate if circ pump two, sorry, pump two proof is yes, okay? So think through it there and notice I, I accidentally grabbed the pump command. That would not be good. I want to see that it actually did come on. Okay, either one of these situations, pump one proof closing or pump two proof closing will cause virtual output one to turn on. So this is where we're gonna call this flow interlock. Okay, we're not gonna apply any overrides to this because we want it to just function straight through as is. And now I can go back to my chiller and say, um, that we want to deactivate this output when, oh, hey, there's my flow interlock is off. So if I reach a criteria where I want my chiller to run, okay, so we're above 44 degrees, I want my chiller running. But if I don't have proof that a pump is operating, then uh, we're not going to allow this output to come on. Okay, so there's your lead lag rotation. We've been through resets. We've shown how you can grab math functions. I've got one other little trick up my sleeve here. This is something that it's not in the literature just yet, but I'll let you know it's there because it, it's gonna be coming, uh, coming down. Um, so something you might be aware of is when you use a rooftop controller, if you have an analog cooling source, a chilled water valve, you need 
uh, from ACI, the little PTA2 adapter that takes the pulse signal from DO2 and turns it into an analog voltage signal. Well, we've got a, a sneaky little feature that we, we slipped in here where if I have my rooftop set up for analog cooling, Okay, so once I've, and I'm, I've got my own math function that's calculating how to do my analog cooling, I can actually go to math, and we'll just grab the last one here, math five, and I can get my analog cooling value and plug it into a math function. So the advantage of this is that now um, I can pull this math function out in the flex IO, use an analog output on the flex IO. We just go um, analog outputs. We're gonna look at a network variable directly to math five. And um, this will be chilled water valve. Cooling valve. And then um, we want a proportional on this. So now notice it is just proportional. It is not proportional integral, okay? Because we're looking directly at a math function. The math function is running its own calculation. So if I tell this 5% and 95%, what will happen is at 5%, we're gonna start opening that valve and we're gonna drive it open more and more until we reach five plus 95, which is 100% is where we will get fully open. If you wanted to have actual full span of this and have it respond exactly, we would do 1%, uh, 99% on that and then your valve will track exactly with your cooling valve position here so and by doing this we, we used to be able to do this well we still can do this by looking at our supply temperature and controlling directly within the flex io but one of the problems that creates is not being able to use the economizer not be able to use that smoothly in there so at this point this analog output three is directly uh, subordinate to the cooling logic which the cooling logic is also going to account for if and when we are using the economizer okay so at this point on the analog side um, with the chilled water valve you can now use the Flex IO as a um, expansion module. If this is something that interests you, um, you will need to get the most current version of uh, the hex file off of our servers. Even if you have 731 um, in your controller, You'll want to update to the new 731. We we snuck it in for a customer that needed this in particular. It just came at a, a specific customer request. So, you know, again, just example of how we are are listening to our customers and um, always looking to add new new features. Um, hopefully, in the uh, in the future, we'll also be able to add this for uh, being able to use stages. Also, one other thing, uh, recalling back to the limitations that I made specifically clear with the, the C1000 Flex IO, how that must come from the factory as a, uh, as a flex because of uh, hardware modifications on the board. Um, we are currently in the process of redeveloping the C1000 and redesigning the board uh, to accept to have those jumpers and that will remove that limitation at that time then it'll be fair game for any 
any controller to be reflashed into any other controller. So um, I know this is a, a very diverse, um, very uh, capable controller, and there's lots of different roads we could go down. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask Sophie here, do we have any questions on the Flex IO? Hi, no, so far I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, so we'll, we'll give uh, give just a, a couple minutes here. Um, if you have anything that you think of you want to send in, um, feel free to reach out to uh, myself or the tech support line. Uh, remember, you can email us at info, I-N-F-O, at proloncontrols.com. That hits a whole group of us and somebody will respond to you uh, for sure. Um, you can also give our tech support line a call, 877-977-6566. Um, so uh, at that, uh, one last real quick check. If we don't have any more questions there, Sophie, then I think we're probably good to uh, call it a show. Yeah, I think we can wrap this up. So thank you everyone for being with us today. Yep, thank you and uh, have yourselves a, a good day and uh, let us know if you have any questions that you think of uh, afterwards on this.